Peace. Shalom. Back again with chapter 20 of The Road from Orion. Yo, don't forget to like and subscribe, comment even, help the big brother out, thank you. And perhaps everything phallic is such, is just a setting forth of the human hidden secret in the sense of the open secret of nature. I can't remember the smile of the Egyptian gods without thinking of the world pollen. Note to Lou Andres Salmon, February 20th, 1914. Rainier Maria Rauch. Setting an hour ago, the sun was gone and now the dark sky glowed with the silken shade of deep blue that the Egyptians called Lapis Luzili. Stars flickered into the existence like reborn souls, sparked by some century outward, so they could rise upward to a point of origin in the universe. But John, his elbow on the table, so his hand could support his forehead, did not see the lights in the darkness. The same melancholy and anguish that settled in the minds of Holderlin, Artard, and Nerville was evident in John, but he disguised it under his mask of reason. He reached for a cigarette while watching Lucia organize her notebook for she was getting ready to retire to her glass laboratory to rewrite her thesis. Standing up, she walked halfway to her lab, then turned around and said, cloning experiment tomorrow morning, sunrise. Like pillars of salt, we blankly stared after her as she retreated into her glass house. Judgment day was near. We were on our way to hell. That night I slept restlessly, frightened by shadowy specters from the minds of the Goya, Nietzsche, Poe, Coleridge, Artard, Nerville, and Bosch. Nowhere in their hellish works would I find any advice about the exact path to eternity. They knew the destination, but now how to go there but not how to go there even quixote had succumbed to the melancholy by the end of cervantes masterpiece despite his chivalry and i wondered if this was the reason for his despair ancient anxious i comforted myself by the idea that lucia had spent years studying Egyptian text as had her grandfather. She had studied the least corrupted pyramid texts from the old kingdom that were carved in the tombs of the pharaohs and the kings along the middle kingdom coffin, texts carved in the coffins of the nobility. She had studied them all. The Amduat, the Book of Gates, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the book of two ways. She had a solid evidential code defining her interlinked, complicated symbolic system that supported her thesis. She understood the intent of the hieroglyphic language and the sacred images. There was no mistaking it. 
Lucia understood the Egyptian religion of the sci of science, and she knew the path to eternity. The knowledge was locked up in her thesis, still her secret code unveiling the meaning of ancient symbols depended on her lambda theory about the lytic pathway. She expected that after our white powder trip through the hell to eternity, we would return to confirm that the Egyptian heaven is simply a quantum experience resulting in a lytic pathway transformation of a human into a viral human. She, sure, she had a lot of evidence for this model, but she wanted her theory to wear the uniform of the scientific method. This would convince the logical positivists, like the narrow-minded Professor Grosch. John and I were simply the means by which she could place her thesis on log logical positivist ground the basis of an actual experiment which with real observers. I thought of Quixote's enlightened logic, what he called the philosophic uh, method. Intuition first, followed by vision, then deduction or premise to conclusion, so that the observed evidence would be linked together. In this light, Lucia's thesis was solid, but the scientific method required that on the basis of a hypothesis, the scientist must predict what, she, what should be observed under specific conditions. As a scientist, Lucia needed a carefully designed controlled experiment to fulfill this exact requirement. If her observations corresponded with her predictions, then the hypothesis would stand. John and I were the key because we were the actual observers that would determine if what we saw matched her predictions. Lucia had no intention of telling us the exact path through the do what hell because if she did, she would sabotage her own experiment by giving us advanced information. She was hoping that we would return and verify the Egyptian predictions about the afterlife and observations, of course, would support the code she cracked and match up with cellular events she observed in her lab cloning experiment. Lucia had circled her basis and she was heading for home. Plate, <laughs> just like Lou Gerd the iron horse who had a slugging percentage of 765 before he died. A DNA sample had already been taken from John weeks ago. Lucia intended to insert his eukaryote DNA into phage lambda tomorrow. The lambda vector would then attach to E. coli and E. coli host cell injecting the recombinant DNA into the one-celled organism. At the same time, John would ingest the gold. Not only would Lucia have a personal account of the journey through the whole cell, but she would also have a controlled experiment. It would all happen in her glass laboratory when the sun rose tomorrow. Trouble and frustrated by my attempts to use my imagination to determine my future, I must admit that I was still uneasy about becoming viral. The thought of Durer's dark angel preoccupied me, for I understood the angel's melancholy, melancholy the sullen angel sitting in its alchemist lab, was thinking about the potential transformation it could make, the heavenly change was not appealing, it was non-human. The engraving's magic square of numbers adds equally, but it was non-human. The engraving, mm, but it was unequal rather. The scales balance, but are off. The infant nymph sits on the grindstone indifferently, 
a cold product of nature, a product of rolling circle replication, a human clone contemplating itself, contemplating that it was still human but viral. I inhaled deeply to stop the rapid explosion of my thoughts. It is difficult to think of oneself without the human form, to think of oneself as an octosahedron or an ecosahedron head with a tail. If it were the transformation that Nietzsche envisioned as the overman, then it may have contributed to his madness. Yet Quixote said, man was the mutation. I trusted Quixote and had an irresistible urge to contact him before the cloning experiment. I calmed myself by thinking that a clone was simply a group of cells that were genetically identical as a result of asexual reproduction. Or a clone could also be the result of incest, which the Egyptians practiced, as did the Persian, Phoenicians, Incans, and Aztecs. They called it royal incest and keeping the bloodline pure. So when a brother married his sister, they shared 50% of their genes. Early tribal societies believed that incest enhanced the magical powers of the mind. It follows that by keeping the pharaoh's bloodline pure, a specific genetic makeup will be preserved, possibly on one, possibly one allowing the Egyptians supernatural abilities, perhaps clairvoyance, precognition, or an ability to perceive the quantum world was due to genetics. The bloodline issue reminded me of the ancestry of the most famous racehorse in history, a high-spirited chestnut named Man O' War, born in 1917. The big red coat was an American World War I baby bred from the pedigree of urban stock on the sire's side and respected English stock on the dams. Of 21 starts, Big Red 120, and during one race at Belmont, he surpassed the field of horses by 100 lengths. Sam Riddle, his owner, was extremely careful, careful with Big Red's training and breeding. For 23 years at stud, Big Red sired 64 stake winners. The fillies he sired became excellent broodmares, filing or folding 124, 124 stake winners. When Big Red died at age 30 on November 1st, 1947, he has set three world records, two American records and three track records. The horse was embalmed and placed in a custom casket lined with racing colors. Like Big Red, the pharaohs entombed and mummified their sacred apis bulls, which were incarnations of the creator god, Ta. What intrigued me about Big Red was the many thoughts his, st his stud career was mismanaged by Riddle who only bred the horse to his own mares. Like the Egyptians with their apis bull, the fiery red horse had a bloodline that Riddle deliberately kept pure. Like Riddle, the Egyptians were preserving special abilities in human beings by guarding their bloodlines and keeping them incestuously pure. Shutting my eyes, I tried to see sheep grazing in green pastures instead of thinking of cloning experiments, codes, symbols, bloodlines, and riddles. I hope I would run into Quixote. Alright, y'all. That's it for chapter 20 of The Road from Orion. We'll be back with 21 the next time we see each other. So again, I say peace. Shalom. See you next time.